Okay. So, um, yeah, so, um, so we had our session on Sunday um, for the practice exam. So that went okay. Um, so that was that. So, um, again, we'll have our exam on Friday, and it'll cover um, um, lectures, well, just chapters 10 and 11, because those are the chapters that we've covered so far. Uh, today we're going to begin chapter 12, um, but um, for those of you who need to, you know, a little bit more time to um, to um, l look at chapter 10 and, and 11, do that this week because you know, we have our exam on Friday. And also, this exam right here, so what I did to create this exam, I basically, like, basically looked at our homework and I pulled like, I don't know, um, a problem from every homework and I made a, another exam problem out of it. And so that gives you an, an idea of how I make exams. So it'll be similar to that, okay? So going through all the homework will give you um, a really good um, preparation for the exam that happens on Friday. Um, so were there any questions about the format of the exam or how I'm gonna make the exam or anything like that or the exam itself, the practice exam? Any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. It will. Yeah, I tried to make the practice exam just like I would make a, you know, the real exam. So I have 10 basic questions and two bonuses that you can do. Of course, you'll, ha you'll have to do the bonuses. You know, if you're really confident, <laughs> you'll have to do some bonuses. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I think on the practice exam, I think there's just one equation, I mean, one problem on there that you really needed a, an equation sheet. I think that was the one for the band pass, maybe. Um, but, um, so if I have problems like that, that would require you to have a, a you know, an equation sheet. Yeah, I would, um, I would either put that um, equation like by the problem, like for example, on Blackman's theorem, I had the equation in that problem, right? Um, so it just depends on like w you know the, what, what the problems are like. Uh, so, so besides those two problems, were there any other problems with the practice exam that you felt that y that y you like to have you know some uh, additional equations with? Uh, Did you see that? The, the, the the, Yeah, the band pass. Okay. 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 Yeah. I mean, because it would help me to, to know, like, um, which um, types of problems, you know, that would help you guys with, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Anything else with the exam? You guys okay with it? Okay. Um, Oh, so what about the time and the difficulty? Were you guys okay with that? You guys thought that was fair? Okay, good. All right. Um, I mean, because it's really hard to try to make an exam to say, okay, well, um, I think this could be done in 50 minutes, <laughs> right? I mean, it's really hard to try to estimate that. And, um, and, I, and I don't want to give you guys problems. I, I know you guys can do the problems, but I, I just don't want to make it such that you guys take longer than 15 minutes to do the problems. That, you know, that would be, you know, a bad exam, <laughs> right? Where I don't give you guys ample time. So I need to make the problems such that they can be done in five minutes each. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, it's chapter 12. Um, okay, so review, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. Not, yeah, chapter 12, not um, lecture 12. So, so we're on, le on, on lecture um, 11 right here. So for, um, for review, um, so we looked at um, these types of single pole low pass responses, right? And remember, this, th this is the form of those types of things. And we're gonna deal with these today, looking at second order, third order, fourth order, just cascaded systems. But they all start with this right here, the, the basic type of single pole of a low pass filter of an amplifier. So remember what that looks like. For the single pole alone, it looks like that. So you're starting off, um, 
right here with the maximum, and then that cutoff right here, then it falls off at 20 decibels per decade. Okay. Um, so here are some of the parameters for the non-inverting amplifier and inverting. Remember what these are. So this is the inverting amp. It looks like that. And see how it's, co it's connected? Um, typically, um, the non-inverting node is grounded, and the input comes into the inverting part. And here's the feedback for this closed loop feedback right here to the um, inverting part. And for the non-inverting, it's, it's usually hooked up right there, where the input is into, is into the non-inverting um, node right here, and the feedback is the non, is the inverting, okay? Um, here's what the amplitude, I, I mean the uh, transfer function looks like, where it's negative R feedback over Rn. Here is one plus R feedback over Rn for the non-inverting and for the inverting. And also we can describe um, either of those with um, a model is typically what's used in SPICE to create um, a macro model of these guys because remember what's inside are 20 to 100 different other components. And instead of simulating each one of those, just make a simple model like that that at least covers the specifications that you're interested in. Okay, and for lecture 12, we looked at um, overshoot right here. Um, I have this on your latest homework too. So here's a table of overshoot and phase margin. An overshoot is just the peak minus final over the final value. So the peak is like up here. Final value is where it finally asymptotes to. Okay. Um, we also looked at gain margin and margin. So gain margin is determined by identifying the frequency at which the phase shift is 180. Right here, here's the 180 part. So this is going to be your gain margin right here. And phase margin is determined by <coughs> identifying uh, what frequency um, omega t um, is this equal to 1, or 0 decibels. And that's right here. So you just drop that down to your phase diagram, and that's your phase margin. So phase margin, gain margin. Okay. And also, we looked at um, Nyquist for several different types of, um, types of things. So here's a single pole, right? Our uh, first order system, here's a second order system, here's a third order system. And we found out that the f um, first and second, they don't get to, um, so, so that's where T, T right here is negative one. It's real right here on that axis. And that's the point of um, instability, but it has to lay, uh, lie within that dome. And so for a first order system, it doesn't get there. So they're pretty stable. For second order systems, they can get really close. Here's where you have your overshoot. For the, like, for example, this is a second order system. You'll have a, like if a, a, um, a step was given, you'll have this overshoot first, and then it'll finally settle down to the right value. Okay, and, and that's like your, um, after all the transits die down. So you'll get close to that um, over here with a second order system, but for this third order system, you can easily get your T equal negative one within your dome, and then you can have this instability. Oh, and uh, remember, um, so this, um, like this piece right here is a blow up of this little um, square right there. So um, this angle from here to here, that's the angle of T. So if you looked at the angle of T right here, that would sweep from here to here. And so your phase margin, right, this from here to here is just, 180 degrees minus this piece, your angle of T. So 180 degrees minus your, ang uh, your angle of T is going to be your phase margin. That's another way of getting that. Okay, And you can see how it matches with a few things. Like here's a unit circle. So that's where T is negative 1. That's where T is positive 1. But that's T is negative 1. And you can see how you know this line right here intersects those two points right there. And it also meets right there with those angles. Okay, so the new concepts. So we'll talk about cascaded amplifier, instrumentation amplifiers, and active amplifiers. Okay, so for cascaded amplifiers, so um, oftentimes um, these single amplifiers don't meet desired specifications alone, right? And so you might have some 
So specifications like you want a particular type of gain, um, some type of input resistance, some type of output resistance, and bandwidth, and there could be more things. But it's a combination of these things where maybe if you just had like one single pole and you'll need to have one of these, yeah, you can meet that. But if you have multiple of these things to meet, you're going to need like a, a interconnected type of system where you have multiple amplifiers. Okay, so that's why you need these connections to meet all of these specs. Um, each amplifier is built by using an op amp with these kind of parameters. You have your A, um, RID, and RO. Those are called the open loop parameters, and that describes the op amp with no external elements. Okay, so this is like the, the op amp by itself. And what we want to do is when we look at these cascaded things, we, we want to try to abstract it such that we can look at each op amp by itself. And I'll show you how, how we do that. Otherwise, if you don't do that, it's sort of like these cascaded amplifiers, each additional one is considered to be a load if you don't do it that way. Okay, but there's certain ways to um, isolate each one. Okay, so here's an example of a three stage, right? So each one, so each box here is a two port, right? You have two ports, um, I mean you have one port right here and you have another port, port right here, okay? And in this case, each one is an inverting amplifier, but they could be different amp you know, amplifiers, but each one is an inverting here, A, B, and C. So here's a two port, and you can look at this entire thing <laughs> as a two port as well. Okay, now the key here is that you're assuming that the uh, resistance R out of A is much, much less than the resistance of B. So, um, so here's A right here. So if you're looking at um, this direction, looking that way, this resistance appears to be much, much smaller than this you know, looking in that way. And same here. <coughs> the output of this is considered to be much, much less than the, um, the input resistance looking that way. So if you're looking that way, you have a very small resistance going in there and a very high that way. And that makes sense because, remember, um, RO inside of here is, if this is ideal, we're considering RO to be zero. If it's not ideal, we're considering RO to be small, so small that it's negligible, okay? And um, so if you have any current going there, I mean, e even if that's a high resistance right here, most of the current is going to go through here, go, go, going to go into that op amp. So um, that's how you're looking at this as being a very low resistance path going in. But looking at that way is high in comparison to the resistance looking in that way. And if you do that, then you can consider these to be all individual two ports being cascaded together. Okay, so another way of looking at that, um, so just, you know, op amp pictures, you could look at it as macro models. So each one of those can be considered as three macro models here, right? And there's some, um, some benefits into considering it as a macro model. Um, but each one is, is, is pretty much identical, right? You, you, you have your, your input resistance, right? You have your output resistance looking in that way, okay? And then you have your, your gain here. And, and, and your output here, your, your, your voltage here depends on what you're getting from your input and your, your, your gain. Okay, so here's one way to look at it. Um, this equation right here is V out, okay? That's what you're getting right here. And at each stage of this cascade, um, the voltage across here is this V and B. I, I know it's right here, but um, this is the voltage across here. Here's the voltage across here. So this voltage across here is, is seen as this right here. and what it is is um, the source times the gain right here. So that Vn right here is really the source, right? And then this right here is from voltage division, right? So, this, so the voltage, like if that is your 
relative ground, your reference point, a relative ground, and then ask Vn higher than that, Vnb, then that voltage right there is the, the, the resistance that's left over, which is Rnb right here, and that's the, the, the resistance that's seen looking that direction into this macro model, divided by the total resistance, and which is the resistance of this right here, R and B, and that, and you're beginning with this voltage over here, which is this piece right here. So this right here is that voltage right there. Um, once you get over here to this piece, this is V and C, right? Same thing, voltage division is the resistance right here, R and C, divided by the sum of these. So this sees only a resistance um, of this right here. I mean, even though you have all this stuff right here, all this stuff is actually in here, okay? But the resistance it sees is only this piece right here. And so it has this resistance and this resistance as a sum on the denominator, okay? And then you have this amplification factor being multiplied by V and B. So V and B right here is whatever was right here, which is all of this, right? So on this side, you have this Vn. I mean, you have this amplification times Vn. Over here, you have this amplification times the Vn of that. So this is where the cascading begins to grow. And you could continue on, right? But this has, just has three of them. At the very end, even though you have a resistor here, you see this, um, well, so, so um, even though you, you have this resistor here, is open right here, so now you're not really including it any, anymore. So it's, it's just whatever this input voltage is right here, which is all of this stuff from here to here, multiplied by your um, gain. Okay, and that's your V out. Um, yeah, that's, so that's your, your, your three stage. So now here's where we try to make our assumption. We try to make our analysis a little simpler. Um, is that um, we're assuming, remember, when you're looking in this way right here, you're assuming that the resistance looking in that way is really, really small, so small that it's, that it's negligible. So you can um, assume that this is negligible and also the output of that resistance right there is negligible. And if this is negligible, it's not here. So you just have RNB divided by RNB. Well, that's just one. Same here, you have RNC over RNC. That'll be one. And so what happens is that you could just approximate it as like this right here. It's just all the A's, all the gains of each of your amplifiers times your original input right here is what you'll see over here. Again, that's assuming that your inputs, your input resistances are all really low in comparison with um, the input resistances that it sees for each stage. Okay, so that's higher, much, that's much, much higher than this. Okay, it's just that the sum is more weighted into this right here. So this is about one. And then so your gain, just your output over your input. So it's just this right here. So the, the overall gain of the cascade is just the gains of the individuals multiplied together. Okay, so um, another thing we have to, um, oh wait, any questions about this right here? Cascades? Um, okay. So, um, okay, so let's look at terminology. And um, so when someone says amplifier, it really depends on, you, you have to look, look at what context they're applying it to. Okay, because there's three ways to look at it. You could look at just this piece right here being the amplifier without any resistors or anything connected to it. You know, that op-amp, you know, that's, that's the amplifier. 
Or you could think of this whole thing as amplifier, where we say, well, this whole thing is either inverting and not inverting. It could be uh, a differential. It could be an integral type of amplifier. You know, it just, it just depends on what these elements are and how they're connected. Well, that's an amplifier, right? Or you could think of the entire cascade or any other combination, but the higher th the, the, the entire thing, you could think of that as an amplifier, okay? So these words are thrown around a lot, but in order to determine exactly what's going on, you have to look at the context at which it's being applied. And that typically gives it away of what, um, um, what they mean by amplifier. Okay, so let's um, start looking at frequency response of cascading amplifiers. Okay, so um, all of these are inverting amplifiers, right? And they're cascaded. Um, here it goes from um, yeah. There's okay. So 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 anyway. So um, so here we're going to assume that the stages do not interact. Okay, so they do not load each other. So we're going to apply the assumptions that we just went through to these things right here. And if you and it, if you do that, then the overall amplification, the overall gain from the output to the input right here is just the individual gains from each amplifier. Okay. Otherwise, you got to throw in the resistances. Okay. The, um, yeah, the, like, like, like the, uh, the voltage gain resistances. Okay, so in this case, you can obviously see that um, since they're cascaded, you see the connection between here's VO1, here goes VO1, here's VO2, there's VO2, VO3, VO3. So they all connect, uh, all can cancel out. Anyway, so um, <laughs> um, you see that you're eventually going to get back to this anyway. But again, you're assuming that they do not interact with each other um, uh, in, in terms of load. Okay, so you can represent it like this if you make that assumption. Um, otherwise, it's going to be more complicated. And then, if each one of these, if if each transfer function of the gain right here, your H transfer function, if you're assuming that they're each a single pole, low pass type of character then each one can be represented like this. You know, so it has a numerator, and that numerator is where the frequency is zero. Then you call that the numerator. And then the denominator, you could represent it like this. You know, so each one of these are going to be represented like that because they're all single pole low pass, right? And so, and we know what this looks like, right? We know that this looks sort of like um, this right here. It goes over then it has a 20 decibel per decade um, fall off, right? Okay, so if this one alone is 20 decibels per decade, w when we have another one right here, then of course, then that's going to be 40 decibels per decade. If you add on a third one, it'll be 60 decibels per decade, and a fourth one, you'll fall off at 80, eight, at 80 decibels per decade. Okay, so um, the bandwidth of all this right here, of the, of the entire thing, um, of the cascade, is the frequency at which the gain is reduced by three decibels from its low frequency value. Okay, the low frequency value. So you could say it like this: Well, um, this, so so w when this value, when this magnitude is equal to the gain, the maximum gain divided by square root of two. That's the value of beyond which, well, that's the value at cutoff. Okay. And um, if all these stages were identical, you could approximate the whole thing as being something like this, where you just have these n number of stages divided by square root of 2. And um, also, what you can do is, um, is also try to identify the frequency that's shifted because of that. So um, what happens here, let me go back to this. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, so um, I forgot I had a slide about that. Okay, so, 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 so basically what happens is that if, if they're all identical, they all have this as a cutoff frequency of each individual, right? But the overall cutoff frequency is going to be slightly different than this by this factor, okay? And um, that's the number right there of um, amps you have in there. Um, and so sort of like this. So, so this right here is the brick wall. This is what you really want, <laughs> okay? Um, but that hasn't been achieved yet. But you could try to be, get kind of close. So what happens is that here's your A of zero frequency right here, and it goes all the way across. And then here's like your negative three decibels from that value. And then if you just had one of these, it will fall off at 20 decibels per decade, your first order. If you had two of them, it will fall off at 40 decibels per decade, and then three at 60 and on. And at, at your, if it's sixth order, then that's 120 decibels per decade that is falling off, okay? But every time you do that, you're slightly changing this value right here because remember, this is going to be your negative three decibels down, and it's not the same for each one of them. So it's close, but there's a slight little shift right here where it's going to you know, move around a little bit um, by that factor right here. So just so you'll know. But it's still around the same value, though, <coughs> as you can see. OK, so let's uh, move to instrumentation amplifier. OK, so um, this is going to be if, if, um, instrumentation amplifier. Then typically what you want is um, you want, so c consider this whole thing like a two port, right? Here's your input port. Here's your output port, OK? And you want your input to your, your, um, your instrumentation amplifier to have like a very large resistance, like infinite resistance. Because um, you don't really want to like, um, like really disturb your system or consider it to be like a load. Um, if it's infinite resistance, it's almost like it's, it's like an open circuit almost, right? Um, so. You can achieve that with two um, non-inverting amplifiers. And you can probably see that here, right? The input is coming in at the non-inverting node, and the feedback is going to the inverting node, and that's you know um, being split by these two resistors. Same thing here. Your input's coming in at your non-inverting, your feedback's going into your inverting, and then from this feedback is getting split too. So it's two um, non-inverting um, amplifiers right here. This right here is a um, difference amplifier right there. And so what you're getting out of here is you're amplifying the difference in signal you're receiving between here and here. And um, here's like the math of that. But what you're getting out of here is you're really looking at the difference between those two signals. You, want, you, you don't want to disturb the signals. That's why you need that <coughs> infinite input, I mean that, that infinite um, input resistance, right? And, um, but you can control, you know, tweak these values to get whatever type of amplification you want out of that, okay? Um, And of course, it's going to be negative because of this piece right here. Th th those are not inverting, but this right there is going to uh, cause that. OK, so active filters. And so um, low pass active filters. So um, active filters are used, um, use feedback amplifiers to realize filters without the use of inductors that are difficult to realize and in integrated um, circuit form. Um, so does anyone, does anyone know why um, inductors are like really difficult to realize in, in most circuits? Um, 
Yeah, it does. That's a, yeah, that's one reason. Yep. Any anything else? Yeah, a lot larger, especially with the components today. Yeah. Um, what other problem can you ha could, did you have with um, those regular coil inductors? You, you guys know what I mean. Like 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 when I say inductor, typically um, there are many ways to make inductors, right? But typically it's like a coil, like this. Sometimes they're circular, and then this part, you know comes out like that. So here's your input, output. But um, what happens is when your current goes around this loop right here, um, it, um, it creates this field, this magnetic field, that stores the energy. And, and, and so that, that, that energy that's being created, it, it, it's like momentum, like, like inertia, right? It's hard to first get current to start flowing because you have to increase that energy into the field. And then once you have reached your, 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 your current, right, then the voltage drop across that is zero. <laughs> but once you try to slow your current down, the field doesn't want to slow down right away. It's you know, working against you, and it's hard to slow your current down. So it, it creates this type of... Um, um, momentum in your your current flow but like was said um, it's hard to integrate these things you know these components because this is typically much larger than your individual components <laughs> right because um, it's so large and, um, and typically it's like laid on top of this stuff if you're going to have it there um, but what's like another reason that causes a big problem Like what, like, um, so what is it about magnetic fields that can cause a big problem with circuits? Well, yeah, and, and, and why is that? Well, yeah, so these magnetic fields, they can pass through anything, right? They, they can pass through lead, <laughs> right? The funny, I mean, for the electric field, it's easy to stop electric field. Right, you just any kind of metal. <laughs> you, you can wrap your cell phone in um, aluminum foil, and you can't receive a signal or send a signal out. But <laughs> if, um, but for magnetic fields, that's not true, right? They can um, pass through um, aluminum foil with no problem. Okay, so that means that all of your circuit components are having this field interfere with it from just in, you know having an inductor there. Okay, so um, anyway, so but they found really good um, ways to um, to go around that using um, active amplifiers. So here is a single pole, and this is like um, an integrator, but it's leaky integrator because some of the current is able to pass through here, even though you're trying to store it here. It's like a leaky integrator type right here, and here's a, a, a two pole. You have these two capacitors right here, so this is a, a two pole type of filter. And so, um, so this two-pole filter, the one, the one we had right here, is right here. And this is what, like if you worked out and did your, your KCL, it would look like this. So the amplification out over your input is this kind of form right here. And if you look at that and say, well, I could pick off some terms by putting it into one of the standard forms of a two-pole low pass of like this, then um, sorry. Um, then what you do, you um, can identify what these parts are. The o omega zero is identified as this, and your Q is identified with this. But you have to be really careful when you're looking at it, it, this in, in this form. So, so even though you're putting it into the standard form, it's a, it's a low pass. It looks like this, right, where this low frequency goes through. But at the very edge right here, you get this peaking before it starts falling off. This is the one you really want right here. That's the one you really want. It's low pass, and then it turns around and starts just falling off. But you can get this peaking right here, or, um, and you don't want this either. Okay. But um, So what this means is that this is not really 
what you define as a quality factor, it's close, okay, but it's like a, you know, yes, there are some values that, 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 that you could plug in here and then it'll look like it's the quality factor, but it's not that in general. So just be careful about that. And now, and also this is not in general the cutoff frequency, but again, you can plug some numbers in there, to get it, tweak it just right so it is, it does match the, the, the cutoff frequency, but, but in general, you, um, um, is that always the case for the for, for this being cut off and always the case for that being Q? Okay, but this is what it looks like. So, um, but they still have the same kind of char characteristic behaviors. Okay, so if you worked that out and you saw and you looked at Q being um, square root of two, then this is like the magnitude response for a maximally flat Butterworth type of filter, and um, so square root of two is like 0 0.7. So this is the one we're talking about right here, okay? Um, for Q being greater than square root of two, you have these kind of, you, you start to have this peaking right here at the very end, that cutoff. And then um, for Q being less than that, then your, um, your bandwidth capability is gone. It just falls <laughs> off like that initially, okay? So it's like, where's your bandwidth? I mean, all your frequencies are just being dropped off except for, you know, starting at this point right here. Okay, so, but for frequency being much, much less than <coughs> your cutoff, um, it has basically has unity gain right here. So it's all one, which is zero decibels, but y uh, unity gain right here is one decibel, I mean zero de uh, decibels. And for frequency being much, much greater than this, then response exhibits a two-pole roll-off at 40 decibels per decade. That's this right here. And then at omega equal omega zero, the gain is um, Q. Okay. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you guys on uh, 